We are going to take a look at some special issues in human nutrition, starting with uh, breast milk and the importance of breast milk versus artificial milk. So if you take a look over here, uh, we're going to make a little comparison chart. So human milk versus artificial milk, and then some of the benefits of breastfeeding and possible disadvantages. So you got to separate this out a little bit. So when we're looking at carbs, the carb content in human milk versus artificial milk, um, human milk contains mainly lactose as the source of energy, but artificial milk versus here, okay, contains can contain lactose and other glucose polymers as well. In terms of protein content, it's 65 to 35 percent whey versus casein protein versus in artificial milk, um, 18 to 82 percent of bovine whey and bovine casein or soya, um, soya protein. So it is bovine means cow. So we're talking about cow whey and cow casein, obviously for artificial milk. Fatty acid content, human butter fat, doesn't that sound delicious? Versus uh, could be palm fatty acids or soy oils. And then in terms of antibodies for uh, disease prevention, obviously it comes in human milk, but not in artificial milk. And these antibodies are produced by the mother. It's an example of passive immunity where the mother's actually passing um, some of those antibodies to the baby. So oh, most doctors would recommend breastfeeding just f just from looking at this basic comparison here. There are other benefits there too though. Promotes bonding. Oxytocin is a hormone that gets secreted that gives this warm fuzzy feeling. Uh, he's obviously not breastfeeding but the mother would be. Um, helps mothers to lose weight after pregnancy. Avoids uh, allergies that could arise from artificial milk from the bovine protein and could reduce chances of conception while lactating. That's an interesting one. Um, while the mother is actually breastfeeding, this is actually going to do some kind of uh, inhibition of her menstrual cycle somehow and reduce her chance of getting pregnant again. And from the baby's perspective, that's good because it prolongs the amount of time that the baby has with the mother before a next little invader comes along and steals all your thunder, basically. Possible disadvantages uh, f from breastfeeding, and this is, I mean, if the mother feels a really close connection with the baby through breastfeeding, then all of a sudden they stop. Um, there have been recorded uh, rates of higher depression, and arthritis problems could be exacerbated as well, too. Okay, that's one special issue. Let's go look at another one. Ethical issues concerning the eating of animal products. For those of you vegetarians and vegans out there, as long as you have a good reason and you understand that you need to make sure you supplement with the proper nutrients, you should be okay. That's what this unit is all about. So honey, eggs, meat, and milk are some important things that come into discussion when talking about uh, eating animal products. So vegetarians, they're okay with e eating, drinking milk and eating eggs because no animals have to be killed to produce those. Um, vegans though are no animal products at all. No milk, no eggs, not even honey. Even though honey, uh, I don't know, bees aren't really harmed. Uh, if you, even if you study it really carefully, it's, it's, bees aren't, aren't very, aren't harmed very much in that process there. If you study this in more detail though, um, even those vegetarians who are saying the eggs are okay because no animals are killed. If you study it in detail, you find that, well, male chickens can actually make eggs and you have a limited amount of space there. So what ends up happening is a lot of those male chickens get killed to make up space for those, for the female chickens to continue laying the eggs. So maybe some animals do get killed there. And what about for milk? Um, turns out cows are only good uh, at giving milk during the 10 months after they've given birth. So they're constantly being encouraged to get pregnant and have babies. So it turns out a lot of those babies uh, start taking up space as well. So they get either killed off for space or killed for food or primed for, for meat or something like that. So that's kind of sad, killing baby cows to make space. If the cows can't produce milk for whatever reason, then they're not very really useful anymore. And that's where the steak starts to come in as well too so some ethical issues arising there let's talk about food miles really quick this is relatively new but it's kind of cool concept the idea is that a food mile uh, food miles are a measure of how far a food item has to be transported from its site of production to its site of consumption so when you ate your steak where did that steak come from if you just dropped a bunch of money on kobe beef well it obviously came from kobe and to transfer that meat there, you know, 
you burn a lot of fuel through trains or from planes or whatever so air pollution traffic congestion greenhouse gas emissions you may have burned uh, the equivalent amount of money in fuel as it costs you to actually buy that steak so is it really worth it um, so these are the reasons going against it going against trying to ship foods too far and the good thing I guess for consumers is that they have uh, a steady supply and more choice so people are saying who are for this movement are saying try to eat food that is maybe uh, grown more locally or even grow your own f grow your own food in your backyard if you can that's a great idea okay that's a cute little diagram there food miles and reasons for consumers choosing f foods to minimize food miles can overall help the environment overall all right we're just jumping from one issue to another issue next one is diabetes and this has come up a few times in this unit and it even comes up in <clears throat> the homeostasis unit as well too you know about diabetes there's two types one is more uh, genetically induced where it's an autoimmune disease which means your body actually starts destroying some cells in your pancreas specifically they're the beta cells in the structures called the islets of Langerhan in the pancreas that that is where the beta cells are located beta cells produce the insulin so if you destroy those cells then you can't produce insulin that's type 1 type 2 is more diet related we can all bring about type 2 diabetes by just over consuming basically and our body starts to become less responsive to insulin it takes our normally high level of uh, uh, not well it's normal if you're overeating all the time then your glucose levels become really high and your body starts to think that's normal. Some symptoms are excessive urination and sugar present in the urine, elevated blood glucose levels and dehydration and thirst as a result of excessive urination all the time. Various risk factors, uh, if you have diets that are high in fat or low in fiber, uh, if you overeat all the time, if you don't exercise, there could be genetic factors. A lot of this is correlation versus cause. Um, so you got to really figure out from the research, are things just correlated and happen to show a link or is one directly causing the other? And a lot of the research has to still be flushed out as a result of all of this. Here's a little diagram you can look at to look at this in more detail from the BBC. If you are diabetic, then here's what you have to do. Small amounts of food and frequent meals. Try to minimize high sugar foods, especially if they're really starchy. And then try to take in foods that have a low GI, a low glycemic index. I didn't know about this before. This is quite interesting. Meaning you eat foods that get broken down relatively slowly, like peanuts, beans, and fruit. So that allows the glucose to be deposited into your blood at a more steady rate. Um, potatoes, cakes, and white bread are high GI foods, which mean uh, you should avoid those because once you eat those, you get an instant high spike in glucose. Not instant, but faster than those foods with a low GI. Eating high fiber foods can also slow down that rate of absorption as well too and make you feel full. So that's a good thing as well too. Uh, diabetes can also lead to other things, coronary heart heart coronary heart disease arthrosclerosis and hypertension which just means higher blood pressure and it's important to note that there are some differences in susceptibility between ethnic groups um, some populations of native americans uh aboriginal australians oh sorry native australians i misread that native australians which are the who are the aboriginal australians and maoris have a higher rate of incidence of uh, diabetes and it's lower in some places like in China, 2% of people are diabetic, that's strange, and uh, compared to 50% in Pima Indians. So if you're from that particular group, and watch out for that and be careful about what you're actually eating. Let's jump into one final issue here, one final issue, and that's cholesterol. You've heard your parents saying, my cholesterol is high. General advice, minimize cholesterol intake, but people don't know that here's cholesterol. It's actually an important component inside plasma membranes, which is your cell membrane and all the other membranes that are inside the cell. So it's important. You actually need it there. And so, but people start saying things like, well, you know, don't take in too much cholesterol. Um, so there seems to be a high correlation between high cholesterol and a risk of coronary heart 
disease. But uh, there are actually two types of cholesterol. There's HDL cholesterol and LDL. And it seems like LDL is the only one that's really implicated. So think about that. Um, reducing your dietary intake of cholesterol has little effect on your overall regular blood concentrations of cholesterol. So that's quite interesting. The liver synthesizes cholesterol anyways. Genetic factors may be more important in terms of your susceptibility to to uh, coronary heart disease and the actual cholesterol that you actually intake. Uh, drugs may have a better effect than trying to work so hard to limit the amount that you take in. And it may just be saturated fats in the end that are the, the culprit. So again, a lot of stuff to consider. Research, correlation versus cause. What is really the culprit when, it, when we're talking about coronary heart disease? Okay, those are some special issues in human nutrition. Uh, watch what you eat because your body is important.